that normally aren't here are here tonight. I joked earlier, our, our brother Mark Matthews is here. He's like, dude, are you just here to intimidate me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to look his way because if he kind of does this, it's like, dang it. I'm not intimidated by him. What the heck? Um, are we ready to go? I gave you guys some homework last week, remember? M memorize all the names of this chapter. So tonight, what we're going to do tonight, um, we're going to attempt the impossible. And that is, again, I'm going to try and read all these biblical names, which could be an impossibility on my part. Um, but we're also going to cover two chapters. I can't tell you if I've ever done two chapters at one time. Um, yeah, chapters 10 and 11. So make your way to chapter 10. Um, chapter 10 is known as the Table of Nations. Um, it is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, which I think most of the times we look at genealogies and our eyes begin to roll back a little bit. We kind of just skate through them. And it's interesting because I don't know how it is with you. You know, again, we might know up to our great grandparents or something like that. Some of you guys might know your family tree. But oftentimes for us, I think here in the United States, it's like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Genealogies. But in some countries, man, it is huge. They don't care what you do for a living. Who's your dad? Who, who'd you come from? You know, that kind of background, you know. And so, so that's why these things are important. And it's important for us to understand that this genealogy in particular does apply to every one of us. It's not just to Noah. It's not just to Shem, Ham, and, 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 and Japheth. Every last one of us comes from one of those three guys. Every last one of us. And I love that because, again, maybe you do some study and go, man, I have traced myself all the way back to Ham or Shem or whoever. I was going to say Shem or Curly, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you go all the way back, and, and some people can. I, I, apparently they can, but we all come from one of these guys here. Now, if you have a Bible that has maps in the back, you might want to, to look through them and, and, and go to the first map, map one. In, in, in most Bibles, map one is the nation, the nations of Genesis 10. Now, if you have a Bible that does not have that, I have some maps, map one here in the front, and I'm going to ask Jeremiah if you could just kind of walk around. And if you want a map, you don't have to have a map, but if you want a map, you can just follow along somewhat. So just kind of raise your hand a little bit. Um, so, so, or, or, or you might want one just so you're not turning back and forth. But, but to me, I love maps. I love to know where I'm at, where I'm going. This, this chapter can be a little overwhelming. And looking at a map, maybe you go, okay, I get it. I get where they're going. So Jeremiah will be passing those out. If we run out, share with your neighbor. Um, now, as one commentator says, or put it, chapter 10 of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel, even among the Greeks, where we find the closest approach to a distribution of peoples in geographical framework. The table of nations remains an astonishing account of uh, account uh, accurate document. And, and, and this person, again, in one of the commentaries I'm reading, he, he, he starts with that because even though we're going to read a lot, again, all of these have significance of where they're going. And, and, and it's interesting because, again, a lot of these commentaries, again, man, they, they just they do all the work for you. <laughs> and I got to tell you, man, a lot of the, the things that, that we will be reading, I have stolen from David Guzik's commentary because he just kind of tries to num name off all, where all these places are at. And with this map, it kind of gives you an idea of which direction they went. And they're color-coded, too, for our convenience. And so we're going to read a lot. We'll, we'll take some breaks for your sake and for my sake. Um, we will, there will, won't be a lot of commentary, especially in chapter 10. 
Um, but wherever possible, we'll try to cover where the, the current names are at and its locations. But let me read to you one of the footnotes that I have in my Bible as it starts chapter 10. It says, this chapter contains the earliest eschatological, no, ethnological, ethnological, like ethnic, ethnological table in the liter, uh, lit literature of the ancient wor world, compiled centuries before the, the Homeric readings or writings. In this table of nations, there is a remarkable perception of the ethnic and linguistic situation in the age of Noah and his descendants. Virtually all the names have been found in ar archaeological discoveries in the past century. So every one of these names, they, they have found out where they, they, they went to and stuff. Now, there's been some roaming going on throughout the centuries, but, but for the most part, this is really accurate of what we have here. And so again, I, I'm going to try to give it the old college try, or high school try. I never went to college of how, how we're going to do this. So let's read the first five verses. Now, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The sons uh, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Ma uh, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Eshkenaz, Riphthas, Riphtha, and Tugam, Tugomar. 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 Okay, Tugomar. The sons of Javan were, were um, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to their language, according to their families, and their nations. So we got, there's three parts, and so I got, I got done with the first part. So we got part those, through those names. Um, again, the, the, the Lord had told Noah after they landed, after they came out, he told Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply, and they have done that. Now, again, we're going to, 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 to go through a span of almost a, a, more than a thousand years as we read all these names. And then when we get to chapter 11, we're going to go back almost to the beginning, just so you know. But he told them to fill the earth, and they've done that. And so this table appears to represent all the known tribes on the earth at this time. And what was going on? There are 70 descendants of Noah's sons that are listed in this chapter there are 14 from Japheth, there are 30 from Hem, and there are 26 from Shem. And so those are all the names I have to read. And so there's just going to be a lot of names here, but, but they're all there. And, and some of these we might be able to locate, we might be able to go to, but other ones we might just have to skip. And so if I skip them, again, ba uh, blame uh, Pastor Dave Guzik for that because he didn't put it in his commentary. <laughs> and so the sons of Japheth were, and then he gives us those, uh, some names here. Uh, Gomer comes, for, uh, comes to uh, the like German type of people in that area. They go in that area, uh, and from whom came most of the, the original people in Western Europe, which include the French, the Spanish, and the Celtic people, the, the, those kinds of settlers up in Scotland and all those areas. So a lot of those people, and again, that's just a, a, a one family that goes up in that area. And then you have Gog, and you have Tumult and Meshach, and those people settled, settled north of Europe, and those people would become the Russian kind of people in that whole arena way up north. Um, Medai, the, he would be more of the ancient Medes, 
and they, and they populated the area of what we know today as Iran and Iraq area. Um, some of those people also went and branched off into India as well. And these will be from Japheth's family. We, we, we have a, 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 another one is Javan. Javan, he, he went more into the Greece area. And, and they would be considered the Greeks and or the Gentiles. And, and, and verse 5 tells us that they were a seacoast people, which means that they were, they were a, a seafaring kind of people that, that, that were along the coast and they used the sea quite a bit. And so, again, that would be up in Greece. Now, the sons of Gomer, it gives us three sons here, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Tagomar. And so, <laughs> Ashkenaz, the son of Gomer, he, 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 they were the kinds of people that, that went north of Judah. So when you look at your map and you see where Canaan and, and uh, the Amorites and the Philistines, they went a little further north of that. And they would be in, in that region that, that you get into Syria and, and those areas. And, and one of the commentaries said something about that these people were called the, uh, a part where they settled, the northern part of, of Judah, uh, Judea. They were called the, the Fertile Crescent. Which, which is the region where they settled, uh, they settled agriculturally in the Middle East and, and in the Mediterranean basin. The, the, fruit or the, uh, the fertile crescent is a crescent-shaped region in the Middle East and it spans from modern-day Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and northern Egypt. And, and some areas of Kuwait, and then some regions of Turkey as well, and then into Iran. Togarmar, 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 Togarmar. They, they are the Armenians that would be kind of north of, of Turkey, northeast, or no, yeah, northeast. And so the sons of Javan, Javan um, these guys are related, let me see, oh gosh, to, uh, let me see, it says here, I wrote down, uh, Kittim could be Cyprus, which is one of the islands in the Mediterranean, Rifa could be, um, could be Rhodes, which is just north, a little bit right under Ludd area, in that er arena, and Gomer would be Germany. Uh, Meshach is like Moscow, and and tu uh, Tubal could be to Tobolsk, 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 uh, up in the in the Russia area, in the Baltics area, up there. Okay, got to, got past that one. Let's go to verse six, to verse twenty. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Reama, Sabtaka. And the sons of Reama were uh, Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began, begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter of the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Cana, Keda, in the land of Shinar. From the, that land, he went to Assyria to build and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, and Kela, Ke Kela, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kela. That is the principal city. Mizraim begot Ludim, Ananim, 
lehebem nephtuhim pathrithim and selisum <laughs> from whom came the Palestinians and and Kaf Torem. Ah, I almost got that one. Okay, verse 15. Canaan begot Sidon, uh, his firstborn, and Heth. The Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, and the Sinites. And the Arvadites and the Zimorites, Zimorite, and the Hamanites. I know I put S's on all of them. They didn't have an S. Anyways, afterwards, the families of Can the Canaanites were dispersed, and the borders of the Canaanites was from Sidon as you go to uh, Ger 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 Gerar. As far as Gaza, then they then as you go towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, as far as Lasha, Lasha, <laughs> I'm running out of breath, man. And these were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages and their lands and their nations. Is it hot in here or is that just me? Because I feel like I'm sweating like a televangelist right now and I'm not even preaching it up right now. Man, oh man. Yeah, hey, I'm hanging in there. I feel like, hey man, you're almost done with that part, man. Woo, doggy. And so here we are with the sons of Ham. And again, Ham was one of the guys that we, we looked at last week who had sinned against his father. They said that he was going to be cursed and, and that he would be a servant and blah, blah. And some people believe that it was him that, that, that just kind of occupied all of Africa and that he was cursed. And that's not, all, that's not the case because as you see, it, it, the names that we kind of mentioned here, um, they're in green and they're not just in, in Africa, but they are in northern Africa where we see some like, like uh, Cush um, that that would be, uh, let me see, uh, some, some went to Babylon, uh, like Nimrod, and, and some of them went to Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is probably not the Ethiopia that we look at today. It's more north of that, kind of closer to the Red Sea, a little below the Red Sea. And Miseraim is another word for Egypt. Put is, is Libya. And so what we see here is they're, they're on the, the northern part of Africa and not deep Africa. And so a lot of those people are not black, but they're dark skinned. But you also see that, that Canaan, they're part of Canaan. And, and that is where Israel, where, where Palestine is at, or the Philistines and the Amorites and all those areas, they go up into that part. But we also see the Hitt, Hittites that are up in what we know today as Turkey. So and then it tells us in verse 8 that Cush begot Nimrod. And now Nimrod is an interesting character and, and, and we, we, we can take note of this man because it says that he was a mighty one on the earth. But not in a good way. <laughs> he was more of a tyrant. And, and, and he ruled over in Babel, which would be up in in what we would know today, modern-day Iraq, in that region closer to the, the Persian Gulf area, in that whole area right there. And, and he was the first one that, and, and we'll see this in, next, in the next chapter, he was the one that really began to organize these human people, these, these, these people, because they were supposed to disperse, and they hadn't dispersed. And they came together, and they were almost wanting to fight against God. The name Nimrod... Um, and again, I keep on going, what a Nimrod. Um, but, um, but the name Nimrod itself means let us rebel. And so that's who this guy was. He was a rebel. And so when it says that he was a mighty hunter, the context is not really talking about that he loved to go hunting and kill animals. The idea is that, that again, he, 
he was more hunting men. He was going after people. He was trying to, 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 cut, to, to, to take over in a lot of areas. And so he would be more considerate of, of, of a warrior, but he was a mighty warrior. And, and so people followed this guy, as we will see in the next chapter. Um, he, it, it's almost like he used his ability of killing and frightening people to, to, to kind of be a despot, you know, a, a tyrant. Someone that would be on top of people and try to bring them down. And so that's who this guy is. And so he, it tells us that his kingdom began up in Babel or Babel, however you want to pronounce it. But these areas up here, it tells us that it's, it is in the land of Shinar. And Shinar is up in the Babylonian area. And so we see that, that he, that's where he took off to. And, and that's where he would reign there. And in the next chapter, we will see... That again, that is where the Tower of Babel would be. And so this whole area was uh, the, the land of southern Mesopotamia. Uh, again, later came to be known as Babylonia or the Chaldea or Chaldea. And, and so again, that's where the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And, and that is where most believe that the Tower of Babel is, is, would be situated. And so when, when he continues on in verse 13 to about 18, again, he mentions uh, Miz, Mizraim, um, Egypt. And, and, he, and Mizraim, again, it, it's in that northern part of Africa, but it would also include another island in the Mediterranean Sea that, that could be Crete. Um, uh, Canaan begot, Canaan begot Sidon, and Heth, and then the Jebusites, and all these other ites, and the parasites. <laughs> um, but, but this line of Ham is, is significant because these are the ones that kind of settled in, in the Israel area, uh, uh, right on the, the Mediterranean Sea. And, and so you have the, the Hittites who are a little higher up, and, and, and then you have the Jebusites, and the Jebusites are kind of important. Because if you remember when King David was kind of taking the area that today we know as Jerusalem, they were known as the Jebusites. And, and, and so Jeb, the Jebusites is Jerusalem area. And so that's where these people were at. The Amorites, um, they were, they were uh, more to the west uh, of that, or not to the west, but to the, uh, well, somewhere around there. They're in that area. Anyways, so, so the Amorites, we see that they were more like in Jordan area, where Jordan would be at today. And, and that's where they settled there. And the Sinites, um, most believe that those would be the Oriental people that, that, that went even farther east. Um, and so it talks about their borders. And so Ham co covered the north, the east, and the south of the Mediterranean Sea almost. He kind of just kind of did this whole thing, skirted around there. Verse 21 to the end of the chapter. Woo! <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm getting excited here. It says, The children and children were born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hol, Gether, Mash. Arphaxad begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons, the name of the one with Peleg, for in those days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jaktan. Jaktan begot Almadad, Shilif, Hazar, Hazar Marvith, Jerod, Jerod, Hadoram, Azel, Dikla, 
Obel, Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jabad, Bab, Jabab. All these were the sons of Jactan. And, and these, and, and their dwelling place was in uh, Misha, as you go towards Shephar, the mountains, the mountains of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their geneal, uh, geneal generations in that nation, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. <laughs> Woo, doggy! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Um, so it's interesting because Shem, he, he, this is the line that's kind of important to us. All of them are, but Shem, he, he's the one that, we'll, that, that we will follow. And, and, and it's almost like maybe he, he put him last because after this, we're going to kind of follow him a little bit more because he will lead us into chapter 12, if you will. And so Shem is important. Um, where am I? Um, he, he, he comes, or okay, Elam comes from him, and Elam could be more of the Persian people, which would again be um, Iran, Iraq, um, Afghanistan, and that whole region up there. Asher is the father of the Assyrians, which is up by Babylon, but closer to Turkey. Uh, Lud is the father of the Lydians, and that would be Asia Minor, which would be towards the north. Aram is the father of Aramanians, Aramanians or, the, or the Syrians. A Faxad is an ancestor to Abram and the Hebrews. Now, one of the things that we need to, to understand, the first one that is kind of mentioned after Shem he is the father of all the children of Eber. The word, or the guy Eber, most believe that we get our, 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 our Hebrew, or, no, we get the word Hebrew from Eber. That, that people were, were, were talking to him about Eber and Eber and Eber. And so they, we get the word uh, Hebrew from the word Eber. Uh, Eber. Whew. And so, where, where am I at now? 11. No, no, we're on verse 30, 23. So, at Aram, Aram, um, these guys, I'm trying to see. Aram, uh, Uz would be like uh, Arabia in that area. And Job came from the land of Uz. And uh, I'm just kind of looking... That 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 last one, uh, Jobab, Jobab. Some some believe that he might be Job himself, the the old Job guy. So it's it's a possibility. I, I put it down there, but but here we have four generations or four great events that 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 happen as we go into chapter eleven. Now we have four great events that happen happen from chapter one of Genesis to chapter eleven. Um, the creation of the universe, the fall of man, the flood, and what we will cover in chapter 11 is the, uh, the, the, constr the construction or attempted construction of the Tower of Babel. And those were the four main events that happened in, in those first 11 chapters. And these chapters, they reveal to us that when man disobeys God, God will judge them, and we see judgment coming upon them fairly quickly, it seems like, because we, we have it in one chapter or in a couple of chapters. But we also see His grace, because after each one of those situations and events, we see that there's always a new beginning. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord ended up killing an innocent animal and clothing them and promising that He would send a Redeemer to them. When Cain killed Abel, the Lord allowed them to have Seth. And again, we all come from the line of Seth uh, for that, in that. And he carries on the godly line as, as well. 
And so the people of Seth, they intermarried with the godless Canaanites. And, and then, you know, we saw that the, the Lord wipes them out with the flood and he cleanses up everything. And Noah and his family uh, believe God's word. And now they are spared. And we get to this point and, and time has now passed. And so after the flood, the descendants of Noah, the three sons, they repopulate the earth. And this new beginning begins with Noah. And eventually, um, they're, they're, they're going to be led into a revolt. And, and you almost kind of go like, man, with all the things that, that God has done in their lives, they go back to sinning. But that's who man is. And, and, and the graciousness of God that he could have just wiped everything out as we begin to read here. But, but again, he, he lets them live. And so chapter 11, let's read the first nine verses. Now the whole earth, had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stones, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens let us make a name for ourselves and uh, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth but the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and the lord said indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, over, from, there, from there over the face of all the earth. And they ceased building the city. Therefore, the name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. It's likely that the events that we read here in chapter 11 occurred prior to or at the beginning of chapter 10. And so we're kind of going back a little bit in history because, again, it's described even in chapter 10 in some of these families that they were scattered in with their, with their languages and, and stuff like that. So it told us that over there, but now we're coming to, to this part where they are still all together. And so the, this describes what they were doing in chapter 10. They had all come together, and, and now God was going to to bring a, a, a judgment on them. Um, the flood, if you remember last week, started in the year um, 2348 B.C. And more than likely, Genesis 11 starts in the year 2200, 2200. And so from the time of the flood to the beginning of chapter 11, where we read that the, the, they're going to come together and build something, it's about 148 years after the flood. And so in that time of 148 years, a lot of people have been born. And, 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 and in a little while, we're going to get into another genealogy, and that will take us even forward. So when this is happening, again, at the end of chapter 9, we saw that that, uh, that uh, Noah had died, but he's alive at this time when, when the Tower of Babel is starting to go because he lived another 300 years after the flood. And so, so when all this is happening, Noah is still alive. It's only 148 years after the flood. And it is quite possible that the story is placed here in Genesis so that it could lead us into that genealogy of, of, of Shem and where we're going because after this, the story shifts. It, it, it's almost narrowing down or funneling down to chapter 12 because after chapter 12, one of the descendants of Shem 
the whole, the, the, the rest of the book just about is about him and his sons and, and what happens after that. His name, Abraham, is all, as we know, and he is the founder of the Hebrew nation. And so all of this is, is not chronological, if you will, but, but it's, it's literary. It's written out this way. Um, God commanded the people to be fruitful and multiply and to scatter and fill the earth. Well, they decided we don't want to do that. We want to stay a little closer to home. And, and, and so what is interesting is all these people are being born. All these people are coming together and they're kind of narrowing down. And God says, no, I want you to multiply and scatter. But they've made them their, their, their way from Ararat. And now they're down by Shinar in the plain of Shinar, which would be closer to Babylon. And that's where they settle. And, and so this move was basically a, a rebellion against God's command to scatter. And, and apparently Nimrod wanted <laughs> them to be in his city and he wanted them to be under his control. And so this tower that is being built here in Babel what is what is known as a ziggurat. And a ziggurat, you've seen pictures, they almost look like, like, like pyramids and, and if you ever see like down in, in, in the Yucatan P Peninsula and those pyramids, they kind of go down like that and they have stairs going up. And so you can only go one way. Well, some of these, these ziggurats, they, they, they kind of go like that, but they're in stages. And you can climb here, but there's one that you can go all the way up. And so on these ziggurats, and again, I'm looking, you can look them up on, online and look at the photos and stuff. Um, when they've excavated these things, they realize that people were climbing and climbing and climbing. When we look at a tower or we hear of, of tower, a tower of Babel and we think, man, these guys wanted to get up to the clouds. No, they were just kind of going up maybe, maybe 100 feet, <laughs> maybe higher. But, but again, that's high. Nothing is higher than they're not building monuments right now. And so to be able to reach that length, what, what they were trying to do is, is, again, they were already starting to worship foreign gods. They brought that in. And so it's more of a pyramid, and it's in steps. And they would, they would get to the top, and there was a shrine normally at the top of the ziggurat where the gods and the goddesses would meet with them. And so instead of going all the way up to heaven, as we sometimes look at the pictures, it's like, oh my gosh, look at how tall that is. It's like, no, they were just elevating themselves above the earth even, kind of trying to get closer to the heavens to where their gods can meet them right where they're at. And so the, the pictures that sometimes we get is like, man, they were climbing like Jack and the Beanstalk, man. They were just going and going and going. And, and God was like, oh, my gosh, they're getting a little closer, you know. We're going to have to stop it. It's, it's, it's nothing of the sort. Um, they weren't trying to reach heaven to de de dethrone God. Rather, they were, they were hoping that their gods and goddesses would, would, would meet them right where they were at, but ab above the earth. And so these, these structures... The structure in the city is called Babel, uh, uh, Babel, or Babel, Babel, which means the gate of the gods. And so this, this project, again, we, we, we think of these people coming together, and, and it's their arrogance and their pride, and, and they're, they're making up their own religion. Again, they don't want to do what God has told them to do. They're, they're trying to do it on their own. And, and, and so they're coming together to build something, but it's different than what we see in Psalm chapter 2 where the nations are gathering together to fight against God. They're not really fighting against God as they are ignoring Him and worshiping another gods, worshiping other gods. And, and so they're resisting what God had, had told them. He commanded them. He gave them an edict to scatter and to repopulate the earth. And they're saying, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to do it our own way. We want to do what we want to do. And so this is where, again, all of this is motivated by pride. Pride in, in, in what they can do. And, and, and when you look at the wording here that they have come together and they are united. And when people are united like this, they can do just about anything, especially if there's fear involved. But, but they are united and I, I love the fact that here they are wanting to go up and, and, and climb up and elevate themselves. And yet it tells us in chapter or in verse five, 
that the Lord comes down. <laughs> and it's not like now the Lord has to come down. It's like, oh my gosh, let's see what's going on. He knows exactly what's going, down, going on. But here are these people that they're wanting to elevate themselves. And, and, and they're going to do a great job because nothing can stop them because they're united. They have everything going for them except one thing. They don't have the approval of God to do that. <laughs> and so God comes down. And I found these quotes as I was reading some of these commentaries. And this quote is from a historian named Charles Beard. And it says, Whom, whom the gods will destroy, they first make drunk with power. And I thought, man, oh man, people get drunk with power. And they elevate themselves to a place where, where not, nobody can tell them no. And they have so much power and they think... Nobody can destroy us. And yet those very things that, they, that elevated them, those, those demonic or the sensual things that elevate them is what brings them down eventually. Warren Wiersbe says this in his commentary. From Babel to Belshazzar from, and from Herod to Hitler, God has demonstrated repeatedly that it doesn't pay to rebel against his will. Proverbs 16, 18, and 19, it says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be a humble, of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Jesus says this in Matthew 23, 12, And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Wiersbe continues, and he says, God is in heaven. Uh, God in heaven is never perplexed or paralyzed by what people do on the earth. Babel's conceded, let's go up, was answered by heaven's claim, let's go down. <laughs> and so in, in chapter 2 of, of Psalms 2 4, it says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. And so, once again, we see that, that, again, God didn't have to come down and investigate what was going on. He knew what was going on. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And, and, and because they have this, 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 this language together, they were going to accomplish a, a lot of things. But God is going to come and disrupt all of it because he's going to put a stop to it. As, as I was thinking about this and, and just kind of reminiscing of what Mark shared on, 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 on Sunday and the technology and all these things a man is doing, man is doing. God will interrupt when he has to interrupt. Uh, there, there, there's times he allows things to, to go on forever and we're going, Lord, how long? And he's going, my loving kindness, my, my long suffering, all of these things giving a man a chance to repent and we see that here that he could have easily whoever was involved in building he could have just destroyed them utterly destroyed them but he didn't he just confuses them to where now they have to spread and he's giving them time and we see his mercy once again that that he intervenes and destroys what they're doing but he doesn't destroy them he allows them to continue to live because in that hopefully they will come back to him Oftentimes, I think the Lord intervenes and we want the Lord to intervene. But we don't want him to intervene when we're messing up. <laughs> we want him to be a little bit more patient with us. <laughs> but when, when somebody else is destroying and, and, and wreaking havoc, we're like, Lord, just get them. And I'm on that bandwagon too. And then I have to realize, it's like, nah, Lord, thank you for not doing that with me. And, and so what, what, what we see here is that he comes down and, and, and he says, let us go down and, and then just scatter these people, confuse them in their language. And, and that would cause them to, to, to spread. The word Babel, again, sounds like the Hebrew word Belel, Belal, which means confusion. Um. Because, because there was going to be a judgment to confuse everything, to break it all down. And so the gates 
of, of the gods, which they wanted to do, had become like the door of confusions instead. And so nothing was going to be accomplished because God was going to, to separate all that. And instead of them making a name for themselves, they, they have a new name for the, the project and becomes, it becomes a, a byword for us or something that we make fun of, you know, babble, confusion, you know, stuff like that. One of the commentators said that in the church, God is not the author of the confusion, but in the world, God sometimes uses confusion to humble people. And, and he allows that to happen oftentimes. And I think it, it, it's a good reminder for us because there's a lot of confusion going on today. And, and so much misinformation and so much stuff. And we're going, ah, oh, we get frustrated. It's like, but who's to say? Who's to say that God is just saying, here, let these babbling fools continue to babble. I will one day stop this whole thing. I will, I will turn people to myself. Now, the word Shem, back in a few weeks ago, the, the, the name Shem means the name or name in Hebrew. And, and Abraham will be the descendant of Shem, of Shem. And God had promised to Abraham that he would make his name great. And we'll see that in chapter 12. It's interesting because, I, except for maybe Nimrod, but it doesn't tell us that he was part of this whole thing. He was just kind of overseeing it. But nobody knows the names of who built this thing. But everybody knows the name of Abraham. The Jews, the Muslims, the Christians, they know the name of Abraham. That name has continued because the Lord has blessed him and will continue to bless him in all the earth. And so... Um, they wanted to make a great name for themselves, and yet God says, no, I am the one that makes the great names and, and, and perpetuates those kinds of things. Um, and what, what, what we can gain from this, I think, as we look at the Tower of Babel and, and, and where it's situated and all that, is, is that, again, it's not just ancient history, but it's interesting because that whole place of Babel and Babylon it challenges us as believers because we, we will see all that. If you read through the New Testament and you get to, to Revelation, you see Babylon the whole time. And it's always, it's always portrayed as, as this worldly, sinful things, you know, that, that are in the world system. But Babylon, again, they would be used of God because in, in, in 606 B.C. to about 586 B.C., they had, the Babylons, God used them to take his people into captivity for seven, 70 years to, to, to cleanse the land because they, they had not allowed it to, 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 to they had not allowed the Sabbath to, to kind of cleanse the land. And so he was going to use Babylon to do that. And as cruel as they were and as adulterous as they were, God used them to chasten his disobedient people. Um, again, through, throughout Scripture, Babylon is, is worldly pride, um, moral corruption, defiance against God. We see all those pictures, um, and, and we can all get caught up in that stuff. You know? So again, all of that is important for us to understand. And there's a, such a, a biblical contrast between this earthly city of Babylon and what we will one day be expecting, the heavenly Jerusalem. Um, because that will bring God glory. The prophet Jeremiah, he prophesied against Babylon in, in Jeremiah 50 and 51. And we see it come to fruition in Revelation 17 to, to 19. So let's read the rest of the chapter. <laughs> More names. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and he begat a faxad. Or Faxad, two years after the flood. After he begot a Faxad, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Or Faxad lived 35 years and begot Selah. After he begot Selah, a Faxad lived 403 years and he begot sons and daughters. Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Selah lived 403 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Eber lived, Eber lived uh, 34 years and begot Peleg. After he begot Peleg, 
Heber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ru, Reu. After he begot Reu, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Reu lived 32 years and begot Surug. After he begot Surug, Reu, uh, Reu lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Surug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. After he begot Nahor, Surug lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Verse 26. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nor, uh, Nahor, and Haran. Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haram. Haram begot Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The wife, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Eschah. Iscah. And Sarah was barren. She had no ch child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his, wa his son Abram's wife. And they went out with him to Ur of the Chaldeans to, the land of the, to, to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Woo, doggy. <laughs> now, what I found fascinating, again, I have this graph in my office. And you see all these names, and you see they're in, in the yellow. And, and Shem, the, the father of all these guys, he was pre-flood. So he's going to live a long time, about 600 years. And what is interesting is that he outlives all these descendants that we, that we just covered here. He, he outlives all of them up to, to, to te, a te, ter, what's Abram's dad's name? Terah. He outlives all of them except for Eber. Eber lives even longer. Eber probably got to know Abraham and Lot. It's interesting because I shared with you that when Noah died, he died in, in, in uh, the year two, 2006, and, and Abraham was born in 2008. And so they miss each other by two years. But his son, Shem, he gets to see all of these people. And, and, and again, I just found it fascinating how all of this happens, that, that they probably lived in proximity to one another and they knew one another. And, and, and I think Eber outlives Abraham, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But it's just fascinating because these people lived and you can see the progression of how they continue to go down from Shem 600 to 400 to 200 to 100 and they just keep, keep on going down. Abram will, Abraham will live to be about 175 years and then it just kind of keeps on going down and down and down. And so I just think it's fascinating that we were able to cover two chapters, aren't you? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I, I am so happy that we're done. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to bless you and thank you, Lord. Thank you for allowing me the privilege, Lord God, to, to read uh, all of this, Lord, to, that you help me, uh, even though I didn't get every name right, Lord God. What a blessing. Um, I guess I'm just stoked, Lord God, that you are with me right now. 
Thank you for my brothers and sisters and their heart, Lord God, their grace that they show me all the time. What a blessing that is to me as well, Lord. But I pray that even as we were able to go through all of this, that you spoke to us, Lord, and you ministered to us, Lord, that you are faithful. Lord, you brought, you brought this whole world down to eight people. And yet, Lord God, this, this small little remnant you told to be fruitful and multiply. And, and through that line of Shem, Lord God, we will see that, that, that Lord, you brought great men after him. Men that, that, that would eventually, Lord, bring the Messiah. And so what a blessing that is, Lord God, because we stem from all of that. And Lord, we're just so blessed that you think about all these things, Lord. And even when, when man disobeys, Lord, you, you intervene when it's right, when it's the right time, Lord. And I thank you that even through your interventions that you could have destroyed, Lord, and yet you let live and you showed mercy and you showed grace. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We, we want to humble ourselves before you, that you would speak to us and minister to us in, in all that we need to do, Lord, for you. And we bless you in Jesus' name.